In today's episode, we are going over an evidence-based guide to patellar and quadriceps tendinopathy. Let's do it. So what's the problem with this condition? I think it's personally pretty stubborn to treat. You'll see a number of studies out there that will talk about patellar tendinopathy sticking around for years. I personally find folks have a hard time get back to their sports without flaring up the tendon pain, right? Oftentimes, folks are not just having patellar tendinopathy. They might have quadriceps tendinopathy, so kind of pain above the kneecap. I often feel like this gets misdiagnosed. Sometimes it's meniscus pathology, right? And the way you treat something like a meniscus is going to be a little different than the way you treat a quad. So I think in general, this ends up being a pathology that's kind of stubborn and tough to treat. And oftentimes, we don't have really have the right um, diagnosis or intervention coming from the physical therapist or the right diagnosis coming from the doctors referring to us, right? I think it's really important that we come up with a really good plan to get folks out of pain and kind of keep them from getting hurt again in the future. So, so what the heck are we going over today? To summarize, we're going to go over the definition of patellar and quadriceps tendinopathy. We're going to go over the anatomy of those conditions. We're going to go over the prevalence, the clinical presentation, the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis, and lastly, treatment. Before we get started, I just want to let you know I made an evidence-based cheat sheet. It's a PDF download that's about six pages long and just goes over all of the bullet points that we're going to be going over today. So kind of what is patellar tendinopathy? What is that definition, prevalence, clinical presentation, diagnosis? I'm going to leave that link in the show notes. I definitely recommend that you download it. It's going to be phenomenal to help you kind of go along with this presentation today. It's also really nice to refer back if you have that patient that comes in with patellar tendinopathy a couple months later and you're like, what the heck did Dan talk about in that presentation? If you download this cheat sheet and go back and take a look and do a great job with your patients. Welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show. This is where we help coaches and clinicians like yourself get your patients out of the pain and back to training the gym where they belong. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and meathead. I love all things strength and fitness. I have my dream job as a physical therapist, coach, business owner, and educator. I've been doing this for several decades now, and what I want to do is help you out, become a better coach and or clinician. Let's do it. Today's episode is part of a two-part series. If you have not yet listened to part one, go ahead and click on the link above. If you are listening to this on the podcast version, I will leave a link in the show notes. I highly recommend you check out part one before you continue on with part two. Let's talk about diagnosis and differential diagnosis of patellar and quadriceps tendinopathy. Okay. So unlike, let's say a patellofemoral pain, which is another very common, um, anterior knee pain diagnosis, generally speaking, these folks are going to have very point tender areas, right? So patellofemoral pain is kind of, kind of a dull, diffuse anterior knee pain. Folks have patellar or quadriceps tendinopathy, usually going to put their finger right on where the pain is. So I'll just ask them, hey, where does it hurt, right? Can you put your finger on the area where it hurts? And if they can, if they put it right, let's say on the inferior pole of the patella, okay? I'm already starting to think, okay, this is starting to look like a patellar tendinopathy, okay? And not necessarily a patellar femoral pain issue. Generally speaking, these won't swell up a lot. So if you have an athlete that comes in, and especially if they had acute injury of some sort and they have swelling within the knee, I am not thinking patellar or quadriceps tendinopathy. I'm starting to think of some sort of joint pathology. So some sort of meniscus or ligamentous injury, something along those lines, maybe a cartilage issue. I'm not thinking about a tendinopathy. What I will say about these is they often have this kind of gradual onset. They start to get a little irritable with jumping in the sport. And then over the course of time, it gets worse, it gets worse, it gets worse. Now, you certainly can have one jump that really loads up the patellar tendon, and all of a sudden your pain starts and you have that reactive tendinopathy. But generally, it's more of a gradual um, increase over the course of time. If you have a more of an acute injury, especially if there's swelling present, I'm not thinking patellar tendinopathy. I'm thinking something else, right? The other piece, and we, we said this earlier, is that generally speaking, there's no pain at rest. So if your knee is kind of killing you and you're just laying down, Probably not a patellar tendinopathy. Okay. These tend to hurt just when we load them up. So if it hurts without loading, I'm not thinking patellar tendinopathy. Okay. The next thing is pain free passive range of motion. So if I have an individual patient laying on a table and I take them through range of motion and I'm fully extending the knee, maybe I do a little bit of a bounce home. So I'm bouncing to end range extension. 
okay? No pain. I fully flex the knee. Maybe I go into a McMurray where I'm introducing some varus and valgus forces. I'm pushing that knee into full flexion, right? It shouldn't be painful. So if you're noticing pain in extension and flexion, you're starting to think joint pathology, not patellar tendinopathy, right? Or quadriceps tendinopathy. You also won't find any joint line tenderness, which may be more indicative of some sort of joint pathology, right? So if it starts to hurt on the side of the joint, I'm not thinking patellar tendinopathy. Like I said, those guys will usually have tenors to palpation directly on the tendon, right? They'll be able to put their finger right on that tendon where it hurts them. Okay. And lastly, there should be no joint laxity. So if you feel like there's a positive Lachman test, right? Um, I'm probably sending them back to the doctor because they might be having some ACL pathology, right? That we need to be taken care of. And uh, we're not thinking a quad or patellar tendinopathy. And even if they have that concurrently, you're probably going to still send back to the doc if you think there's some serious joint pathology going on. So how about patellar versus quad tendinopathy? Okay. Is there a difference between the two? So one's above the kneecap, one's below the kneecap. Do we treat these two exactly the same, right? So if you start looking around in the medical literature, some studies just lump them all together into patellar tendinopathy, okay? Or they lump them together as a quad tendinopathy, okay? So when they're reporting on quad tendinopathy in a research paper, they might actually be talking about a patellar tendinopathy or quad tendinopathy. It's a little hard to know, okay? When I found... The two are probably treated pretty similarly. And to be honest, there's not a whole lot of research on quad tendinopathy specifically. And that's mostly because it's probably not as common. But keep in mind that in some of these studies, they just lump the two disorders together. Okay. And they just call it a jumper's name. Okay. Um, so again, if you have patellar tendinopathy, it means you have pain kind of below the kneecap. If you have a quad tendinopathy, it means you have pain above the kneecap. They're treated pretty similarly. What I will say is I tend to see a lot of quad tendinopathies, uh, more so because I don't see as many jumping athletes, I think, right? <clears throat> Two things that occur in the quad tendon. So an end range knee flexion, the quad tendon takes more stress. The other thing is that the quad tendon starts to provide surface area for the patella femoral joint. So this is a pretty complicated phenomenon that goes on with the quad tendon. I'll try to explain it as best as I can. I'm using my model again. <clears throat> Apologize to the podcasters. Check out the video at some point. So when I descend into knee bending or knee flexion, I will have more or less area available for the joint to dissipate forces. Okay. So the more surface area available to dissipate forces, the less stress goes through the entire joint. So think about if someone takes a knife and pokes it into you, it goes right through your skin, right? Let's say someone takes the same amount of force and they punch you with their fist. It hurts a little bit, but your fist is not going through that person's skin, okay? So in the case of a knife, there's a very, very small surface area that's going into the skin, right? Think about a needle or a knife goes right through your skin. Someone punches you, broad surface area, the area is more evenly distributed, Okay. So within the patellofemoral joint, as I sink into more and more knee flexion towards the very, very end range of knee flexion, I don't have very much surface area available to dissipate those forces. And that's why a lot of folks will say deep squats are bad for the patellofemoral joint. However, as you get into end range knee flexion, the quadricep tendon is actually available to help dissipate forces, right? So now you actually have the quad tendon coming into the joint and helping to share some of that load, okay? So what that may mean is that the quadricep tendon gets some compressive stress in the very end range of a squat, okay? Now, this is entirely a theory. I have no idea this is what's occurring in my patients, but my patients do a lot of very deep squatting. Think about Olympic weightlifters. So at the very end range of a squat, it's full knee flexion. Maybe you're getting additional compressive forces on the quad tendon right above the patella because it's now sharing a little bit of contact with the patellofemoral joint, right? And for that reason, you might get some more tendinopathy there. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the fitness pain-free mini course. So I made a mini course. It's absolutely free. That's the next logical step. If you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective but doesn't really teach you how to work with high level athletes in the fitness world, right? Doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. 
doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym. Doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over, seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to getting your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. It's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym. But if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. Once you sign up for the fitness pain free mini course, you will be automatically placed in the wait list for the fitness pain free certification. Now, the fitness pain free certification is the course, the certification that I wish I had as a new grad that fills in all the gaps in knowledge that you don't get in physical therapy school. So A, you'll gain complete confidence working with injuries in the strength and fitness world. You'll learn optimal technique for both health and performance from myself and some of the best coaches in the world. You'll master programming for rehabilitation and injury prevention. Have fun while earning a whole bunch of physical therapy and physical therapy assistance credits. You have 31.5 of those. You'll also gain NSCA credits as well as CrossFit credits if you need those. This is the equivalent of a university education in working with injuries in the weight room. I really believe that. I've been adding to this thing over the past five or six years. It's massive, a ton of phenomenal information. And lastly, the biggest goal is just to fill your day with the patients you love working with and building the respect and admiration of the communities you love working with. So I'll leave a link in the show notes, sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. The certification is open four times per year for one week to enroll into. If you're on the wait list by signing up for the fitness pain-free mini course, I'll alert you when that next enrollment period is open and you can get started. Let's get back to the show now. All right. So what are the evidence-based treatments for patellar tendinopathy and quadriceps tendinopathy? So first and foremost, your first intervention should be some sort of exercise-based intervention, okay? We have a bit of research to show this is going to be superior to surgery, right? It's far less invasive. Obviously, you're going to try some exercise before you try other things, okay? Now, in terms of which exercises are most effective, we'll actually go over that in a minute, but your choices are usually some sort of eccentric exercise, heavy, slow loads, moderate loads. We've actually studied recently and isometrics. Okay. And all these seem to be beneficial. If you have a stubborn patient that's not progressing well, and I would say you need to give them a good three to four months worth of physical therapy and treatment. If their pain is not getting any better, there's a few other things that can be tried. So I kind of recommend having an alliance with a, lo a local uh, physiatrist it's really, really good with different types of injections, as well as extracorporeal shockwave therapy, because this can be extremely beneficial for your patients. Okay. So let's say your patient is not doing very well with exercise. You're giving them several months. You're just making no progress. What's the next step? Well, they can go and try different interventions like injections, right? So think about a PRP injection within the patellar tendon or quadricep tendon. I know that stem cells is another option too, a little less research um, from that perspective. Another less invasive, but still kind of painful treatment is called extracorporeal shockwave therapy. So they're using shockwaves to treat the tendon. The idea is you're trying to stimulate a healing response. So for whatever reason, this tendon is not getting better with exercise or rest, whatever it is, we're trying to stir up that healing process. So extracorporeal shockwave therapy will help with that. Basically, think about a sledgehammer hitting the wall. There's going to be some sort of energy that comes off of that, right? So extracorporeal shockwave therapy, you're obviously not hitting your patients in the knee with a sledgehammer, but the technology is similar, and that's going to help to stimulate that healing process. If you start looking through the literature on PRP injections, shockwave therapy, you're going to find mixed evidence on the efficacy of it. But to be honest, there's some good research showing it can be effective and helpful, and I've found it to be beneficial for these refractory cases that aren't getting good with a really solid physical therapy program, right? And the last thing that can be tried is some sort of surgery. And usually it's just some sort of debridement. They go in, they try to take out some of the pathological tendon. And it also can be beneficial for refractory cases. It's just that you probably want to start with exercise. If things are not going well, maybe tweak the exercise a bit more because maybe your programming wasn't as good as it could be. You're really having no success after several months. 
refer to a good doc you trust. They can mess around with some PRP, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. And if things really still aren't going well, then you could potentially try some sort of surgery, which all these things do have some efficacy. And I wouldn't be afraid to recommend to your patients. So what treatments from an exercise perspective are most beneficial for patellar tendinopathy? All right. So this is a kind of a complicated subject for a lot of students and kind of younger grads that I talk to, uh, just because there's usually some sort of hot study that just came out talking about a very specific type of exercise for tendon problems that everyone's kind of hot on doing, right? So there's quite a bit of research on different types of tendinopathies, especially the patellar tendon, which is kind of nice. We can just go back and read some of these. So if we compare different types of exercises, what seems to be most effective? So first, if you compare an eccentric exercise with an isotonic exercise, which is more effective? So for a long while, there's a lot of research in tendinopathies coming out on eccentric exercises, which essentially means that you are stressing the muscle with a load while the muscle lengthens, and then you don't stress the concentric phase. So a good example would be a step down task. Let's say you step down the stairs, right? Once you get to that lower step, you help yourself getting back up to that stair you're at previously with the other side leg, and then you lower back again with the involved side. Okay. So when you go down the stairs, the muscles acting eccentrically, it's eccentric stress, of the tendon as well. So early on, a lot of research to show this was beneficial. When we start comparing eccentric exercise to isotonics, which is essentially adding the concentric with the eccentric together, right? Think about doing like, let's say a lunge. There's an eccentric phase and a concentric phase. What we found is both of those are effective and, you know, progressively loading is probably the big thing that's important, right? The other kind of hot thing with tendons has come out more recently is going to be heavy, slow loads. So there was a pretty good paper that was looking at heavy, slow loads in the lower body for patellar tendinopathy. They're looking at, I think it was leg press and a couple other exercises. They were doing 12 rep maxes and they worked their way down to six rep maxes. So essentially they were going from higher reps to lower reps. So the loads were increasing over the course of time. And they were also using a tempo. I think it was around four seconds down, four seconds up. So a relatively slow movement and the loads went up to around 90% of someone's one rep max. So pretty dang heavy, right? And a later study came out in 2021, right? The American Journal of Sports Medicine. And this is from Aggregard et al. Sorry, I definitely botched that. Um, and they were looking at moderate loads versus heavy, slow loads, right? So the moderate loads are only 50%, 55% of someone's one rep max. And they found similar outcomes, right? So both of those things improved knee pain, okay? So I think it's funny. People are always like, oh, you got to use eccentrics or like they say, oh, isotonic just as good or it's just heavy, slow loads is the best thing. To me, it sounds like we have a lot of different options to help our patients. And I'll kind of talk about how I like to put this together. But at the end of the day, you can kind of pick and choose based on what you think is going to be best for your patient. A lot of things work. So what about isometrics, right? There's a lot of research out there about isometrics improving tendon pain, right? Uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to understand that the research we have on isometrics and patellar tendon pain is looking at short-term outcomes. So essentially, your pain levels in the next hour following doing isometrics, not looking at long-term progress with isometrics. So if you have an exercise program for a patient that comes in with only isometrics, right? And you're expecting a long-term change in that person, I would say you're not following evidence-based practice. Okay. So isometrics have been shown to be helpful in the short term for folks. I think there's a place for them for treatment, but if you want to see those long-term outcomes, you probably want to do more loading with eccentric and concentric, maybe a little more eccentric, right? That's probably going to give you a better long-term outcome. Okay. However, we found isometrics to be very effective for folks in the short term with pain. And a lot of this research is coming from Ebony Rio. Keep in mind, this research is mixed. And it's also mixed depending on the tendon you look at. So the Achilles tendon behaves a little bit differently than patellar tendon. I will use isometrics for a lot of different tendon problems. But keep in mind that these tendons probably behave a little bit differently, right? So Ebony Rio's research, what she did... But she has folks do an isometric contraction. Think about doing an isometric contraction in knee extension machine, right? Set to 60 degrees of knee flexion, and you're pushing with around 80% of your maximal contraction. They use MVIC. They measure this with electrodes. Kind of hard to do that in a clinic, right? But you can tell people to push around 70, 80% of their max. 
right? They did five sets of 45 seconds and they reduced pain dramatically. So they test a single legged step down task on a slant board and ask these folks how much pain they had prior to the treatment. And they reported around a seven out of 10. I think this was in volleyball players, right? Afterwards, they did isometrics and asked how their pain was on the step down task. And their pain was almost zero out of 10, right? So that's very, very powerful. In this study, they also looked at isotonic. So let's say you want to warm up the tendon by doing a bunch of knee extensions. Is that as effective as doing some isometrics? Well, I'll tell you what, the knee extensions did reduce pain as well, but not as good as isometrics did, right? The other thing is that there were um, changes in cortical inhibition with isometric group that we didn't see in the isotonic group. So it does seem, at least from some of Ebony Rio's research, that there's something in these isometrics. Personally, I will try these in the beginning stages of rehab, right? I'll do it before our rehab session. And if there's a big effect with those, I'll keep them, right? If we do the isometrics and it, it seems like there's no effect in the short term, patients aren't feeling much better, then I scrap them. We move on to something different, okay? And the last thing is plyometrics. We don't have a ton of research about plyometrics, plyometrics with tendon pain. Most of the research is more in these isotonics, eccentrics, heavy slow loads, moderate loads, right? It's not a lot of plyometrics to get a knee pain. Uh, for these folks, they generally don't really tolerate plyometrics early on. But the problem is that these folks are trying to get back to a jumping sport. So at some point, we have to give them some sort of plyometric, right? So how do we put this all together, right? We have we have all these different types of exercise that help. We have athletes that are trying to get back to jumping. How do I create a program for the person that's in front of me? So we have a pretty cool paper in JOSPT 2015. The authors, Peter Maliolis, Jill Cook, Craig Purden, Ebony Rio, basically the all-stars of tenant research, right, in the physical therapy world. And they kind of created this guide on which exercise to choose for folks in order to help folks get back to sport, right? And... What was really, what really stood out to me is they kind of talked about tendons and how much stress a tendon will tolerate, right? And if you think about a tendon, what a tendon does, what's its job? It's really kind of an energy storage device, it kind of stores and releases energy. Think about jumping, the tendon is going to store energy and then release it, right? The hardest thing for a tendon to do is store and release energy very quickly under a heavy load, Okay. So if you're doing a very challenging jump, let's say with a weight vest on, that is a ton of stress to the tendon, okay? The more you slow down that movement, the easier it is on the tendon because there's not as much energy storage. And if you do an isometric, it's even less stress on the tendon because it doesn't have to do that energy storage the way it would for a fast explosive movement, okay? So if you have a patient in front of you, you can give them whatever intervention they're able to handle, right? at that time, right? So if I have a basketball player that has some pain, but not that much, I'm definitely not going to start with isometrics because they can already handle isotonics and maybe they can also handle some plyometrics. So I'm going to meet that patient where they are in terms of tolerance. If I have a patient that comes in that can barely walk because their knee is hurting so badly, then yeah, I'm going to try some isometrics just because generally speaking, isometrics are well tolerated just because they're much, much easier on the tendon. Okay. We know all these different types of treatments have a good effect. So you probably want to pick the uh, intervention that's going to meet that person where they are in terms of irritability. And you also want to pick exercises that are going to be specific to get them back to whatever activity they want to get back to. Okay. So if you have something that's someone that's very irritable, maybe you start off with some isometrics and some easy isotonics. As they start to improve, you can give them some heavier isotonics. Maybe you start with a tempo, and over the course of time, you reduce that tempo. Maybe you start with some higher reps, and over the course of time, you go down to lower reps. As that person is tolerating heavier loading, we start incorporating more energy storage exercises, which is a fancy way of starting to jump, starting to run. We're incorporating more change of direction drills, whatever it is. And as the tolerance gets better and better and better, we slowly return back to sport over the course of time. Okay. So in my mind, it seems like most of these different types of exercises are all beneficial. So I'm just going to give them the hardest exercise that they can tolerate well. And over the course of time, I'm just going to make that more and more specific to the activity that the person wants to get back to by increasing loads, increasing speeds, and getting back to whatever activity. Because a rehab program for an Olympic weightlifter who has to be able to produce force relatively quickly out of the hole in the squat, right? 
under heavy load is much different compared to a basketball player that has to jump and land and run, you know, for a large period of time, right? Very different demands. So the rehab programs would probably reflect that. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. If you enjoyed this episode so far, I have a very similar episode, but on patellofemoral pain syndrome. It's an evidence-based guide to this disorder, patellar tendinopathy. Quadriceps tendinopathy is very similar to patellofemoral pain, but the diagnosis and treatment is a bit different. Patellofemoral pain is also much more common. So if you're a physical therapist, chances are you're seeing more of this and less of the tendinopathy. So definitely click on the link here. I'll also put a link in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast version of this so you can continue on with your learning. Thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, comment, subscribe, please. It really helps that algorithm, allows me to continue making content like this in the future. If you're listening to this in the podcast version, please leave a positive rating and review. Helps me out tremendously. That's it for today's episode. If you want to go that extra step in supporting me, please consider subscribing to Fitness Pain Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content from me. I've been doing this for about five years. You've got over 100 webinars, eBooks, and complete guides. Access to a private Facebook group to ask me any questions you may have. You can decide upcoming podcast topics. And really, it's just $1 to get started. So super low barrier to entry. It helps me out tremendously. You can cancel at any time. I will leave a link in the show notes, but if you want to check it out now, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library, and get started. Lastly, if you want to check out any of the references, I'll leave them in the show notes. If there are any big articles that I'm missing on, please let me know about that. Leave a comment, and I'll see you on the next episode.